Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I would like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated in the house here today. Thank you, Brother Ricky, Sister Kimberly, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit singing in us and through us. Amen. Praise God. Well, go in your Bible this morning to John chapter 1, please. John chapter 1. And as you turn there, let me encourage you that we are still in the holiday mood here. Amen. I was telling Sister Sharon earlier, I, have, I think it's the last day I can do it, but I've got Christmas socks on today. And, uh, I don't know if they go with everything, but I have about seven or eight pair, and I started in November because I'm going to wear these some this year. And When you could be seen in your socks, you're wearing shorts, and there's no really festive holidays. And then we wear our socks in the winter when nobody can see it. Seems like a waste, but I just wanted you to know, in case you were worried about that. John chapter 1. We're going to read about half of this chapter today, and then we're just going to discuss it, okay? John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, the word, this is John's Christmas story. Matthew, Mark not very much, but Matthew and Luke capture for us the physical, the, the logistical, what's happening in the natural world at the birth of Jesus. But John does not skip that. He shows you his viewpoint or what the Holy Spirit wants him to capture. And so this is the Christmas message for the believer. For those who know Jesus Christ and you've received him as Lord, this is what you need to know. Is the manger beautiful? Absolutely. The wise men, a great part of the story? Yes. But this is what excites you and I. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, oh, I love that. We're not sure what it is, but now we know it's a He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life, his life brought light to everyone. John chapter 1, verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. I wanted to stop at nine, but I read ten. I want to talk to you today about this uh, kind of after Christmas thing. Christmas has passed. What did we get? All right. I told you last week I got, uh, Sister Pam got me walking sticks, and they're just awesome. I think it was Thursday. I had a really great uh, walk and prayer time. I've, I've prayed each day since. One day I didn't get out. The weather wasn't that great. It might have been Thursday, and it was great Friday. I don't know. But when I'm out, you know, outside of the city and I'm walking, um, the walk, I think, is always better. You know, I'm not watching for cars to hit me or anything like that. But I don't scale my success by anything except how I feel in prayer. And I had an excellent prayer time one of those days. Now, listen, I, I do nothing different. I just want to encourage you that prayer doesn't always feel super successful. It may not always feel like it's encouraged you or buoyed you as you navigate through the storms of life, but it is doing that. I keep doing, I keep praying, I keep going. And um, I think my walking sticks help me, but nevertheless. 
As I was um, navigating through the journey of life this week, I was just, and somewhat last week as well, just struck by this thing of, okay, we kind of measure Christmas by, you know, did we give good gifts? Did we receive good gifts? Did we have a good fellowship with bringing people over? Or did we have good fellowship by going to someone's house or event? But I think there's something for us as believers that is more critical to how we measure Christmas, right? And Christmas is now gone. But I want to remind you that John takes us into understanding what we got. Hallelujah. Do you know God is a giver? God loves to give. It's his nature to give. We see evidence of him giving constantly. Now let's break this down just a little bit here this morning. Verse 4. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. So the everything is people, animals, birds, fish. He gave life to everything. That's evident, right? Because all of those things are alive. He also gave light to everyone. Now, your dog doesn't have the light. He may kneel down beside you and put his little paws out and act like he's going to pray with you. I've seen video of dogs that have been taught to do that. I'm not confident that their prayers are heard on high, but if you believe it, praise God for you. You just encourage your dog to pray. And then tell him he's fasting with you this week, okay? Well, maybe not your dog, but if you have a cat, absolutely. No food or water for 21 days. (laughs) Pastor, how can you say that? He gives light to everyone. Now, obviously... That means that believers and unbelievers have access to the light. But not everyone appreciates the light, embraces the light, receives the light. Not everyone lives life without criticizing the light, without condemning the light, without mocking the light. But he's God. He's he's a lover of people, and so he gives light to everyone. And then God begins through John to kind of narrow down what impact this has and who it touches. Here's another part of this that I like. You can uh, check out any part of it and break it down more, but we won't uh, take time for all of those verses this morning. But five, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Glory to God. Don't be worried, gang. Don't fret over this world. Don't be anxious about the politics of the world or what's transpiring in our country or other countries. The light can never be extinguished by the darkness. And you have thousands of years of human history to prove it. I uh, am reminded of the illustration. You've, I think, heard it as well. I forget who it's credited to, but many, many years ago, I believe it was a king saying to someone in his court or on his staff, prove to me there's a God. And the response was the Jewish people, your honor or your highness, the Jewish people. And that's, that's, uh, that is one of the proofs. Look at all of the other ethnic groups that are mentioned in the Old Testament. Look at all of those different nations that not only were they raised up and then defeated, but many of them ended even ethnically. Now, some are still with us, the Egyptians, for example. But the Jewish people have persevered. How much more so the church of the living God, no matter what has been against it. No matter what pressure, no matter what circumstance, no matter what politics, the church has never been extinguished and it never will be. The light of the Lord Jesus Christ is never going to lose. Amen? All right, well, let's get into what I want to I do. 10 through 13. John chapter 1, verse 10. He came into the very world he created. Oh, I love that. He came in. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he created this world? And then he came into it. But the world didn't recognize him. He did not come into it as a military hero. He did not come into it as a Greek god or a a Greek, whatever they called their... uh, 
Or Zeus and all of them? Are they gods? All right, Greek god. He didn't come as any of those things. He came as Matthew and Luke tell us as a baby in a very poor circumstance. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Number one, what did we get? What, what did he leave with us? What did he bring at the, at the birth of Jesus Christ through his life because of his death, burial, and resurrection? What do you get? Number one, the right of becoming a child of God. The right to become a child of God. Glory. That's no small thing. Come on, ask the Muslim. You, you follow Islam. You've given everything to, to be Muslim, and you would hear to this uh, prophet, Muhammad, ask the Buddhist, come on, and ask them if they have become a child of God. Come on, Muslim, are you a child? Does Allah love you unconditionally? Has he delivered you from every entanglement? Does he have your best interest at heart? Has he promised you to live with him and reign with him? Has he offered you his life in exchange for yours or yours in exchange for his? Has he given you a throne to reign on? Is he calling you son or daughter? And the answer is no. But for you, believer, for you, child of God, that's exactly what you get. When you begin to unwrap the goodness of God, what you find out is it's not just a trinket here, it's not just an offering there, but it's God saying to you, I give you adoption. I own you. You belong to me. Glory to God. That's what John says. The Holy Spirit through John tells us that we have been given. Now, where does it come from? To all, verse 12, who believed him and accepted him. So there's kind of two parts there, or multi phases, however you want to look at it. He gave the right. You have the authority. You have the institutional. You have the legal. You have the royal right to say, I am a son of the living God. You don't have the right to say you are the son of the living God. But you do have the right to say you are a son of the living God. Amen? with all of your faults and all of my failures, in spite of our struggles and sin, having been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ and been, giving new life, been, been given new life and the ability to walk in the likeness of Jesus Christ, he says, you have the right to be a child of God. He came into the world he created. That's verse 10. The very world he created, but the world did not recognize him. Now you and I recognize him not because he was a baby in the manger and not because the wise men and the shepherds all came at different times and worshipped him. We, We recognize him through the work of the Holy Spirit. He comes to us and says, I want you. He first loved us. We did not first love him. He finds us in our brokenness. He finds us in our struggle. He finds us in our weakness. And he delivers us not just from the things of the world, but unto himself. That's the God we serve. He created, oh, I was looking at uh, some of the, uh, I was going to bring a couple of the articles, but I I just couldn't find things that I I, I could distill down to simple phrases. There were some articles this week about what we're seeing out in the, universe around us. And I was reading about, and I don't even remember what magazine this is in, but about the expansion of the universe. And uh, one of the articles was somebody asking the question, if, if, we, if we say that the universe is 50 billion light years across, or whatever the number was, but it's only 13.8 billion years old. Now they've, they've narrowed it down. I saw one that was 13.82 billion. And they said, that's exactly, exactly how old the universe is. Well, exactly. So if you're off by 500 million years, it's fine. (laughs) 500 million this way or that way, it's no big deal, right? 500 million. Anyways, and they said, 
what they've discovered is that the darkness, the blackness of nothingness, what's between the stars, when you and I look up at night and the sky is dark, that, that blackness, it can expand at speeds that can't be calculated. It expands almost at a speed that is infinite. Everything else moves only at the speed of light. So it can expand like that, but everything in it, all the planets and stars, they can only move relative to the speed of light. And it was like, wow, this God of ours is so cool. And yet they know that it is finite. There is a limit to the universe. And then they always hide this question. I think it's the elephant in the room. What's beyond the universe? The one who made it. Amen. And they get so focused on a star or a quasar or a dark hole. Uh, they get uh, black holes, that's what they call them. Or they get so focused on dwarf this or mass of that. And this equation and Einstein and Newton and, and uh, some of the others. And, and, and they're seeing all that and they can't even see the one who made it. Because you have to look at all of that and then say, wow, he chose a unique path in coming into this world. Even though he created all of it, he came here. I found out something else this week that I thought was fascinating. There's nothing known in the universe that isn't rounded. Don't you find it interesting that in Revelation, the holy city, New Jerusalem, is expressly described as a cube, square, Glory to God. It'll be the first thing, the first object. Now, I know we as people have made all kinds of those things, but everything else out there has roundedness to it. And uh, this thing is going to come down. It's unlike anything else he's ever made. And that's why I believe Jesus emphasized, Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. Hallelujah. Uh, you and I have an invitation to a place that is unlike anything in this visible universe. It's altogether perfect. It's glorious. It's new. It's spectacular. And that's our destination. You and I are just about sick of wearing these masks, right? No, come on, let's say it. We are sick of wearing these masks. But we're doing it because the unbeliever... All of them who say when we're talking about uh, unborn children, it's my body, it's my choice. But now they say, <laughs> it's your body and your face and it's still my choice. You wear your mask. Now listen, we're, we understand because this life is all they have to look forward to. They have to protect it. They have to preserve it. They don't understand that it's not that big a deal to us. We're not fighting for every ounce of energy to live here and to remain here forever. We know we're limited, that this life is temporary. But there's another life. Amen. Come on. Hallelujah. All right, here's the second thing. Look at 14. So the Word became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Now, do you see this? This is the Christmas message. This is the manger and Mary and Joseph. This is the baby. This is the shepherds, the wise men. This is what is spiritual behind all of that. It's not mystical or unreal. It's, it's more real than what we saw in the manger. But John, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is showing us what's happening in that. We read in Luke, and the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you, Mary, and you shall bring forth a son. But it's not just a baby. It's not just Mary's genealogical journey and how important that was, but it's this impregnation of the Holy Ghost and all that's taking place in that. The creator of everything that's visible and that which is not visible is now choosing how to come into this world. And he chooses to come in as a baby. in a manger, next to the animals. Not just any animals, but the sacrificial animals. Not just any place, but Bethlehem. 
He's choosing to come in in such a way that every scripture from 500, 800, 1200 years ago is being fulfilled. Not just being fulfilled generally, but to the letter. He's choosing to come in in a way that he's planned since before the first Big Bang. He's choosing to come in in a way that he will be able to say to everyone else, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you, for my way is easy. Come and find rest for your soul. That's the way he's choosing to come in. Now John says that the word became human, dwelt among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. We've seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. That's what the angels saw in the field. That's what they declared. That's what the shepherds saw. Verse 15, John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds. Again, this is John the Baptist. This is the one I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. Number two, the reward of seeing his glory. What do we get? From this baby? What do we get from his life, death, and resurrection? We get the reward of seeing his glory. John is looking back. He writes his gospel long after Paul has written his letters. And yet, Paul was already declaring in his letters, he is the fullness of God among us, he is the express image of God. He either is, or you and I are worshiping idols, and we are headed for hell. Because the worship of anything made in the image of God is a violation of God. And it requires death. So whenever you think about Jesus Christ, you don't have to wonder, well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure is he really God. And if Listen, you've staked your life on this, your present and eternal life. Go all in. Jesus invites you to go all in. He is the king of glory. He is the image of God in fullness in human form for you and I. Number one, the right of becoming children of God. Number two, the reward of seeing his glory. John said, we saw it. They weren't there when the shepherds saw what they saw. They weren't there when the resurrection power came into the tomb. They weren't there when Jesus entered back into the presence of God in heaven above. But they were there when he opened the blind eyes. They were there when he saved the drug addict. They were there when he restored the marriage that couldn't be restored. They were there when he answered prayer. They were there when he broke bread and fed the multitudes. They were there when souls came to the altar. They, see, when you and I talk about the glory of God, yes, there's an aspect to it that is the brilliance of light and it's consuming, and all, but there's another aspect to it that you and I are able to witness anytime we want to if we just press through and see what the others can't see, to see with the eye of our spirit what the eye of the body can't see, to get into where Jesus is working and say, look at the glory of God. Look at the glory of God. Now, it's usually exhibited in a way that you'll be able to tell it, and almost no one else around you will. You will have prayed for something, and nobody even knew about it, and it will be happening, and you'll say, oh, this is the Lord. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then what's required of you and I? That we praise him and thank him for it. That we say, God, this is amazing. You are worthy of all praise and adoration. And that we continue to look back at those things to give us confidence that when we pray, when we spend time with God, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That we are not praying just to fill up time, not just to do a religious duty, but we are connecting with the God of all glory. And when we connect with him, he connects with us. He sees what we need and says, I'm there. I'm with you. I'm on the journey beside you. I've come alongside to empower you and to help you. The reward of seeing his glory. You only know that if you realize that he made his home among us. I love how the New Living says that, verse 14. The King James says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The New Living says the word became human and made his home among us. 
And he was full. Not mostly full. Not most hours of the day full. Not sometimes full. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we've seen his glory. Now, there were times when John saw something that you, with his physical eyes that you and I have not seen. The mountain of transfiguration. Amen. In Israel, they'll take you by in, in certain trips, certain tours, if you're going that direction. They'll take you by. We did not go on it on our last trip, but uh, it's just a plateau, a, a kind of a plain, and then boom, this dome-shaped mountain or hill. I, I forget, 1,000 or 1,200 feet high or so, and they, they believe that that might be the mountain of transfiguration. And you say, wow, if only I could have been there, been alive to see that. Why? But I'm telling you, there are places where the Lord wants to bring us. There are times when he wants to visit us and show us his glory. Whenever you need healing and he heals you. Whenever you need victory and he gives you the victory. Whenever you need a financial blessing and he does it, you are seeing the glory that came down on him on that mountain. It wasn't glory that he had never known before. It was the Father reminding the world this is the glory he always had. Because John said he existed long before me. Now, is John speaking of him as having an existence? No. He's using a figure of speech that says, listen, you got to understand, he's not like me. He, he was before me. I'm here. You know about me. You know, but, but him, you don't know about. You, you think you know because he was born in Bethlehem. You've heard some of the stories, but you know nothing. He existed before I was ever born. All right, we're running out of time. Here's the third thing. Look at verse 16. From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. If you mark in your Bible, I don't know what version you're using, but I'm, you know I use the New Living. Mark that or, or highlight it or just dog ear your page so you can come back to that. I saw that phrase the other day and have not been able to get away from it. Look at what that says. From his abundance... We have all received one gracious blessing after another. You can say, but I know other believers who have received more gracious abundance than me. I know others who've gotten more blessings than I, and I don't understand. And I could, it has nothing to do with quantity. It has nothing to do with measure. It has everything to do with positioning in response. Are you grateful? See, God's not going to say, did I give you enough blessings when we stand before him? He's going to say, my word says, I gave you blessing after blessing. We're not going to be able to argue about anything. We're not going to be able to vindicate ourselves or justify ourselves. Absolutely not possible. On the day of standing before the Lord, it's his word that we're going to answer to. It's what's been revealed to us that we're going to have to talk about. And the Bible says that from his abundance, he has showered upon us. You can say, well, I don't see it that way, but it doesn't matter what you say. You see, you, you can say, well, that, that applies to others. They got more than me, but that's not what you're going to be able to argue. The question is going to be how I respond to that. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Number three, what did we get? Christmas has passed. What did we get? The reception of blessing after blessing. I, I know that this life doesn't give us lots of things. No matter what you have, you're always going to see other things that you find appealing. Right? We keep having Christmas every year. We never say, well, you know, I've done received everything I ever want to receive, and so let's stop having Christmas. We never say to our kids, you got, a, you got more last year, really, than you should have got. 
You know, I really had thought about that coal idea and bringing you some lumps of coal. And this year I've decided, I, I've shown you all that goodness all, all these seven, eight, nine years. That, I'm done. Time out. Whoa. You don't understand what this is costing me. We don't do that, do we? We keep coming back and birthdays and special occasions. Why? Because the nature of God in us is to give. Not just believers, but people. And we always kind of find it somewhat off-putting when we find somebody or talk about somebody that we think is not really a giver, right? They never show any appreciation. They never do anything for others. God says, that's all I do. And you and I have received one blessing after another. Now, the Greek word here, does it footnote it in the... uh, I don't think the New Living does, but you can find this. It has a footnote there if you go to the bottom of the page. Other trans or receive the grace of Christ rather than the grace of the law. The Greek reads, received grace upon grace. Now that word in the Greek you'll recognize, it's charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. It's where we get the idea in the Corinthians, the letter to the Corinthians, of gifts. And these are especially meaningful when we talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So all through the New Testament, you see God emphasizing to us the value of what we've been given. And I want to point that out today because what does the enemy attack when he comes against a church? When we think over history, you can say, well, you know, he attacks spiritual leaders, and if they uh, fall into some sin, or what, then he's done great damage in the church. And, and that's true. Or we can say, well, he, he attacks financially, and if there's financial impropriety, then it does damage to the church. And, and that's true. But I would submit to you that his greatest attack against the church is to s- seduce us into believing that we can do the kingdom of God without the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's his greatest attack. Thousands and thousands and thousands of churches in America are not experiencing and have not experienced for years and years, maybe many of them not at all, anything that involves leadership and morality or financial impropriety, and yet they are without the gifts of the Holy Spirit and accomplishing little or nothing. There are all kinds of wonderful arguments. Well, that was for back then, and now that the church is established and we're more mature. Oh, I can't wait for some of the preachers to say that to the Apostle Paul someday. We were a much more mature church, so we realized we didn't need what you had. Ha! Boy, I can't wait to see how that goes. Others say, well, there was an understanding in the scriptures and those things came as signs for that time and they were to mark the introduction of the gospel and oh wow how about that you know that's interesting too and what we see is in those places where they let go of his abundant gifts they also sacrifice his abundant evangelism People don't get saved because your church is better than the next church or prettier or paved parking or brighter lights. They don't get saved because everything's wonderful among the greeters and the ushers. They don't get saved because the music is great, the preaching is great. They get saved because the Holy Ghost comes upon them and convicts them and brings them to the cross of Jesus Christ and says, you were a sinner, but now you're saved. Live like it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is. There is absolutely no doubt about it. He is referencing here the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. They didn't walk with a religious leader who did nothing but teach. They walked with a powerful person that lived it among them. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed the hungry. He brought people out of darkness and disease and poverty and lack and he miraculously provided and how in the world would the apostles then turn and say but even though he did all of that you don't need it but notice that the Bible's talking about all all meaning everybody or all meaning all the believers he says all have received light but not all take advantage of it. But to all who have, his abundance of gifts have been provided. That's what it says, doesn't it? Now I'm I'm tweaking it just a little so that it's abundantly clear for you. 
But that, uh, listen, we can draw no other conclusion. Verse 16, from his abundance we have all received one charis after another charis. Gift after gift. This is what is missing in our church today. In the last days, Jesus did not ask, will there be great community outreach programs? Will there be beautiful buildings? He said, when the Son of Man returns, will there be faith? You and I have to, 2021, move into a place where we see the charis of God one after another. And people have been saying, well, it's coming, it's coming. And I've been telling you, I agree, and I appreciate those who prophesy that it's coming, but I just want you to understand that it always comes when there's nothing else that we can choose. In other words, the pressure is so intense. The intensity of the opposition is so powerful and so dark that we are able to finally admit to God If we're going to be the church, we're going to have to have the power. If if we're going to be the church, we're going to have to have the gifts. And and I'm not limiting that to nine gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. I'm I'm including the the other gifts of, of hospitality and government and helps and all those things. But I'm also not eliminating those nine gifts, signs and wonders that are generalized or categorized into tongues and interpretation, prophetic messages that help us to understand where we need to be headed, faith and miracles, deliverance from unclean spirits. Oh God, if there was ever a time. I was reading yesterday on one of those, web, we have a website here that tells you all the bad stuff happening in our area, all the police reports, and this shooting over here, and this overdose there, and this one's already deceased, and call for the medical examiner here. Like, oh God, when is the church here? When are we going to say, enough, enough of the beautiful steeples. Hallelujah. Thank God for them. It's a beautiful picture of our city. But those are just the outer trappings. What he promised to his church is one charis on top of another. When there's a healing, a deliverance follows, a message in tongues, an interpretation that says, get ready to endure hardship. Be strong in the midst of oppression. The message that comes from heaven that says, I will not leave you. I will not abandon you. I will not orphan you. When things are difficult, look to me. When you don't understand, trust in me. When you and I are seeing one charis upon another, we are not looking to our own understanding. We're not leaning on our own ability, but we are wholly dependent on God. Wholly dependent on the presence, the working of God. Not just religion. Look at where religion goes. Even the Christian religion, come on, gang. You can say, well, it's because the theology wasn't right or or they gave up this part. They didn't maintain that. But it doesn't matter. Catholic, Baptist, Pentecostal, Assemblies of God, Methodist, it, it doesn't matter. Whenever we stray over several generations from one charis upon another, The Holy Spirit eventually says, okay, if you don't want them, I'm not going to force them. So the bigger question is, how do we get them? How do we get to this place of saying, oh, look at this. He, he gave us the answer. Our job is appreciation. Every time you see one, there needs to be an appreciation in us. In about, if if you don't know what to fast for during the next 21 days, in a little over two months, if everything holds the same, I'm I'm headed to Pakistan. And so during these 21 days, if you want to add something to your list, I'm not going to give you a prayer guide yet. I'll do that later. But even during these 21 days, would you please pray that God will make a way and that God will open the doors and that God will give us power, the team and, and everybody I work with, just give us power to go to that place. And then would you pray and fast that we will see one charis on top of another? Because if you're ever going to give an altar call and watch thousands of unbelievers, thousands of those bound and chained in other religions surrender and run to Jesus Christ it's only because of charis on top of charis pastor why are you using that Greek term because I want you to embrace the word charismatic we've allowed the 
mainline church. We've allowed the unbelievers to hijack that word and to twist it as they do with lots of words and to now make it sinister or at least unappealing. Now, part of that happened because a lot of things within what was labeled the charismatic movement uh, really weren't helpful. But it's what God promised. Charis power. Charis. It's not just the story of a pregnant girl who decided not to get married until afterwards. It's not the story of some guys that were watching sheep and came and said, this is wonderful or some smart guys from another country. It's not just the story of a boy who was in Israel and very religious lifestyle. This is the power of God because that boy who became a man was choosing how to come into this world before the world was ever created. He was choosing the miracles that would take place. He was choosing the path that he would walk, the words that he would say before even the earth was formed, before any of the hills or valleys were created. He was choosing. And when he came, the fullness of God dwelled within him. And yet he humbled himself and died so that he could give Gifts to men. Because Paul said when he ascended, quoting from the prophet, that he would give gifts. If you're settling for a Christmas without gifts, I feel so sorry for you. I'm so sorry for you and your faith. Because that's not the Christmas that he died for. That's not the celebration that he came to provide. If you are living life without gifts. I I was in, um, I forget what country, a few years ago. El Salvador, I think. And I was praying for people. And there was a family there uh, from Ohio. They were there doing some uh, ministry. And um, I heard, I talked to them afterwards. And they're young people just teenagers, 17, 18, 19, they were getting on the city buses and they were allowing God to use them on the buses and God was ministering through them and they were speaking prophetically and watching people healed, physically healed on the buses. And before they would get to the end of the bus route, people on that bus would be getting saved one after another after another. Come on, this is about bringing new life to people. This is about rescuing from the darkness and allowing them to see the light. This is about people having an experience with God so that they know that they're not just a person bouncing through life, but they are a son of God or a daughter of God, that they have been brought in by adoption, and it's the gifts, the power of the Holy Spirit that confirm that and say, you are valuable to the creator of everything. Come on, stand with me this morning. Let's close our time together in the word and let's enter into a time together in engagement and worship. The altar's open for you today. I'll pray with you or you can pray on either side of the altar. But I want you to, to where, right where you are, I want you to talk to God about his gifts today. I don't know which ones. I don't know that he has this one for you or those ones for you. But what I know is he ascended to give gifts to men. It's his passion. That's the Christmas he came for. And when Christmas is over, when Christmas has passed by, we've got to know what we got from it. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we come with appreciation today. We come with love. We come with respect. We come with reverence. Mm, Thank you. Thank you for what you did for us on the cross and in the manger, but thank you even more for what you did before any of that even began. Thank you for what you did after by giving us gifts. Hallelujah. You've given us gifts. Oh, wonderful Jesus, you've given us gifts. Thank you. May we be May we be appreciative of them. May we be stewards of them. May we be receptive in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, your heads are bowed for just a moment. Enter into this. I want you to enter into it right now. Tell the Lord, Lord, I will be grateful. Thank you for the gifts that I have. 
I know it's not selfish for me to ask for more, to believe for more, to desire more so that others will benefit, so that others will be blessed. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gifts. Make those gifts powerful among us as a church. Don't ever let us be a church that says the gifts aren't necessary, the gifts aren't welcome. We've got everything. We don't need those gifts. We don't want to be too emotional. We don't want to be careless. We don't want to not be thinkers. Lord, forgive us for pushing gifts to the side, even here at Central. And help us, Lord, to become vessels that are hungry for the gifts, that welcome the gifts. Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, right there where you are. Tell him, tell him, at work this week, Lord, I need the gifts to stay healthy in the midst of this virus. I need the gifts. I need the gift of healing. I need the gift of faith. I need the gift of miracles. Lord, people all around me are becoming really ill. Even some that I love have passed away. But God, I trust you. You're the God of miracles. You're the God of healing. You're the God of gifts. And you love to give your gifts. It's your nature. Come on, come on, church, come into it. Those of you who are in your home right now, they're in your living room or in your dining room. Come on, come on into the gifts. The Holy Spirit says, come on, don't just have Christmas morning and forget about it, but come on into the gifts. Come on in. Stay in them. Thank God for them. Welcome them. Appreciate them. Honor the Lord for them. Honor Him for them. He ascended to give gifts unto men. But pastor, anytime there's a gift of tongues there has to be an interpretation no there doesn't I walk hour after hour tongues after tongues not looking for an interpretation I'm just worshiping and I'm edifying myself because 1 Corinthians clearly says he that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself spend some hours each week in tongues and then start correcting me but until then let me do my thing okay I will not apologize. I will not back down. I will not move away. I will not surrender it. I will not let it be hijacked by others. Come on. This is a blessing. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. Come on, believer. We're in a post-Christmas in the middle of a pandemic world, and we need to be edified. We need the Holy Ghost to edify us. You've got to move into it and say, God, I love it. God, I welcome it. I know people will say, well, now you're charismatic. Now you're Pentecostal. Now you talk in tongues. But God, I love it. They can try and be derogatory. They can mock me all they want, but it's the gift you gave. I don't know how many demons I'm pushing back. I don't know how many chains I'm breaking, but this is the gift you've given me, and I'm going to rejoice in it. I'm going to war in it. I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to sing in it. I'm going to pray in it. The Holy Spirit says, do not fear and do not be swayed by those who preach fear. But walk in faith and confidence, says the Lord Almighty. Confidence in His Word. Confidence in His presence. Be filled with His Spirit and His gifts will come upon you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lead us, Lord. Lead us. Lead us. Come on, right there where you are, in your pew, right there where you are. Say, well, I, I don't want to be as loud as you, Pastor. Then don't be as loud as me. But under your breath, with your lips moving, come on, enter in. Come on, it's a new year. You've got to get started in this. You've got to make 21 a year of gifts, a year of moving supernaturally. Come on, the church needs, not central, but the kingdom of God around the world needs the spirit-filled church 
to be empowered once again. If we're going to take the gospel into dark places, unreached places, if we're going to reach nations and change the course of history, we're only going to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirits of religion. I've been there. The spirits of Islam are bigger. They're bigger. They're intimidating. They're ruthless and violent. And if we're going to if we're going to take the gospel into these kinds of places, we've got to be spirit-empowered. We've got to be gift-enabled to go and to declare and not to be afraid, not to back down, but to stand firmly and boldly and say, the love of God is here. And you can be a son or a daughter. Come on, move in, move in, move in. Jesus, come now. Come now and visit us with Holy Spirit power. taken enough time. Brother Ricky's going to lead us in a chorus, and in this chorus, come on, move move into that. Just worship. Let it go. The, the greatest way you can experience this is not to think it. Don't overthink it. Don't think it at all. Just don't. Just let whatever feeling is inside, let it go out. It'll be fine. The Holy Spirit will guard it, guide it. You won't be a mess. Well, I might say something wrong. That's the great thing about it. You can't say anything wrong. Well, I don't know if maybe I'm saying a bad word in another language. It's not possible. You can't offend. You can't mock the Lord Jesus Christ. No man speaking by the Spirit denies Jesus Christ. And if you're worried, you're still in control. Just let go. Let it flow, just like you would pray in English with a, a, a great anointing that you would say, Jesus, 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 just come on. When that starts, the Holy Spirit will take control. And you'll fly like a bird set free from prison. Amen. I love you, church. We are going to have a blessed 21. And in these next few moments as we worship, I want you to position yourself to be a warrior over the next 21 days to stand. Even if you medically you can't fast with us, the next 21 days, we're going to war together. And if you're fasting differently than us, that's fine. However God's leading you, but together we are going to do battle over the, these next 21 days for young people, for youth ministry here at Central. We're going to do battle for international ministry and, and, and missions and evangelism. We're going to do battle for people to be set free from drug addiction. We're going to do battle to be safe from this virus. Amen.